this week's program. We're going to be introducing you to the third story of our trilogy regarding mental health. This one is aimed straight at youth because they need as much help as anybody else. In fact, a different type. But before we get to talk about that and talk to the appropriate people, we're going to be talking about irrigation with Tony Daverin. Ross Mitchell's here to talk about the Royal Agricultural Ambassador Awards, which are sponsored by Harcourts. And also Jim Grierson will be talking horticulture. But just a moment or two, it's animal health, prevention and cure. Antibiotic stewardship is basically yes. stopping it becoming <clears throat> overused, I guess. Exactly. Used appropriately is probably the right word or the right way of putting it. So antibiotic use has really it's come you know, under the firing line a lot, really, in recent times. Uh, the World Health Organization have, have marked the development of antibiotic resistance as a major, major factor um, facing the health of the world, really, of humanity around the world. And, it, you know, we... We're predicting that within the next 20 years, we, we will all know people who ha will will die because of uh, sustaining infections that we just can't find a drug to to so fix to resistance. Cure. Exactly, and so rightly or wrongly, and there's there's very stringent arguments both ways. Um, the the food animal industries around the planet have been targeted somewhat in regards to responsible use of antibiotics, and so. Um, I think we all have to take uh, face up to that and take some responsibility for it. Uh, and that means, although primarily the target falls on the likes of myself as a veterinarian because I've, co of course, got the prescribing rights to these drugs, but it means that all of the food animal industries have to, have to play their part and we all have to accept that we have to do things appropriately and perhaps accept that maybe we have to do things a little bit better than we have in the past when it comes to appropriate use of antibiotics. There's some very simple simple rules of thumb that, that you know, we really need to, to look at. Um, so resistance development in, in, in um, bacteria um, can be pretty much paralleled really with parasite resistance. It works almost exactly the same way from a biological perspective. In other words, you you uh, drown a population of, of organisms that you don't want around with, with drugs to kill them and there's always a small proportion that are going to be a little bit more resistant and so as you, as you keep up uh, that saturation of that population with these drugs, that proportion of of the organism that survives is going to get greater and greater and greater with each sustained time the drugs used, and so over time we can rapidly uh, develop a, a large proportion of that particular type of organism, be it a bacteria or a parasite, um, that is no longer susceptible to the drug that we were reliant on. So basically, it may not. It, it, it may not be fitting well, but it's strong enough to be able to, to reproduce. Exactly. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, that, that's exactly right. So after c subsequent infections with the same population of bugs, uh, maybe initially we might have had 1 in 10,000 of those organisms survive that insult with that antibiotic. Then over so many thousand more populations or reproductive cycles of Which that, won't take long. Exactly, with bacteria then we may end up with a with a situation where 25% of that population is resistant and then we find ourselves in major, major grief. And so it doesn't take, uh, <clears throat> it's, quite, it's quite an easy concept to understand that one of the big issues is to stop exposure of these populations of bugs with sub-therapeutic levels of antibiotics. So in other words, antibiotics at levels below killing phase um, because that, that sub clinical or, or sub-effective dose is sustaining that population to much more, uh, it's not killing them so they continue to reproduce and the negative effects of that, of that drug they are going to develop uh, strategies or proportions of the population that, that are getting better at surviving. In other words the weak ones are going to die but the stronger ones are going to keep, keep surviving and keep, and keep breeding. And so uh, it's very important when it comes to the farmers out there listening to this that they understand that if you're going to treat an animal with an antibiotic, the first thing to understand is, is this use of this antibiotic, is that in the same vogue as what your veterinarian has allowed you to have this drug 
for, for that appropriate use. So for instance, we, we all, there's veterinary orders out there um, on dairy farms, for instance, that will quite rightly ensure that, that uh, farmers have access to penicillin, let's say, as a nice easy example, for the use of foot disease in dairy cows, for instance, infectious foot disease. And that, re that has a, a large reliance on that, on that dairy farmer, one that he's going to use that antibiotic for that appropriate reason. And if there's another uh, reason or another problem, it's probably not a great idea just to grab the penicillin and assume it's going to have the same effect. So what you're trying to say, I guess, without, without being disrespectful mm -hmm. to you, is, is that an antibiotic isn't just one, there's a whole, lot, whole raft of them and you've got to be specific. Exactly. There's, there's, there's certain conditions and certain infections with certain bacteria that are going to be more effectively controlled or cured with certain antibiotics. And also, it's important that as a farmer you're aware of the symptoms of these diseases that you've been given this antibiotic to treat. And if it's out of the box or you're a little bit unsure on what's going on. If you, for instance, have a lame cow and you think, well, its feet look all right, it doesn't look like a foot infection, well then perhaps it's actually an inappropriate thing to do just because it's a lame cow, because it doesn't fit the bill for that foot infection, to first try just jabbing it with antibiotics. Because if it doesn't fit the bill and you're a bit unsure yourself whether it is a foot infection, perhaps it needs looking at or perhaps it needs another strategy taken. In other words, just simply reaching for that bottle of penicillin is not the right thing to do if it's not if you're not confident yourself that that's, that's the condition that's being treated. Is there an alternative? People talk probiotics? Uh, probiotics are useful in a sense that uh, if you've sustained an animal to potentially antibiotic use and you've wiped out a lot of good bacteria and let's face it in ruminants we're reliant on bacteria to digest the cellulose and the grasses that they're eating um, so there is potential when we're using antibiotics for other conditions that we've killed a lot of good bugs and probiotics are a good way of replacing good bugs that we might have inadvertently killed out or perhaps if we've had a bad, for example, a bad bowel infection where a, a large proportion of the flora or the bugs living in the bowel have become bad bugs, disease causing bugs, and they've pushed all the good ones out the way, well then in those scenarios probiotics may be, may be a, good, a good answer. And as far as non-antibiotic uh, approaches to infection, that is because of this issue with antibiotic resistance, that's a massive, massive area of research where perhaps using uh, kind of disinfectant type scenarios that make an environment less likely for bugs to like living there rather than killing them, that's another big research strategy that, that's there to, to try and avoid antibiotic use altogether. Nick, thank you very much indeed. May 2020 come when it's all clean and all good. <laughs> Just a moment or two, we'll be talking with Tony Dabberin. Winter. What's the recharge been like? Um, yeah, it was great back in you know March and April when we were all thinking this was going to be you know winter from hell sort of thing, or you know an awesome and a winter from hell. But yeah, we look we're half, you know sort of halfway through the first month of winter, and uh, since that, since those April rains uh, when we got two really significant rainfalls in a row, we've had very little. In fact, uh, it's kept the surface really wet. But if you look at the foothill rivers, they've sort of receded back up the plains a bit, um, shallow groundwater's sort of come up or anything that's connected to the to those rivers is, has risen. But our deeper groundwater where most of our guys, most of our clients in Canterbury take their groundwater from, um, particularly north of the Rakaia River or just a little bit south of the Rakaia River, we've had very little recharge since then. And you know we're starting to reach that point where we go, hmm, uh, we're running out of months uh, because really that that recharge needs to arrive probably in the next month before, so that we can see the response in the groundwater by the time we get to September the 1st or the middle of September. So, you know, I, I spoke months ago about needing, you know, 500 odd millimetres over the winter. Well, you know, it started pretty promising. We got sort of a third to third, close to halfway, but mainly a third of our way there. And it's just dried up again, you know, and, um, yeah, we really could do with some with some serious serious easterly 
rainfall, southeasterly rainfall. Which will not, not southerly or northwest. Yeah, the southerly, the southerly is. Uh, it, we get a bit of rain out of the southerlies, but you know we're usually talking in that 15 to 20 millimeter stuff. But, you know, we, we need to think in the 50s to 60s to 80 millimeter events, and uh, you know they've disappeared on us at the moment, and 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 the long range actually for for June in particular is for it to be uh, perhaps a little bit colder than average. Uh, and I think um, you know people will probably uh, testify that, that they've had to have a bit of heating on in, in June. We've had some pretty severe frosts and some of the some of the days have been pretty cold, but without there being a really significant amount of rainfall. So uh, if that's the case, then we're going to go through June and not get not get a substantial uh, response to the groundwater, and, and and that's a concern really for particularly for Canterbury. If you go into parts of the North Island, for example, like Hawke's Bay. Um, they don't have any problems with recharge. They are chock full, and there's water lying all over the place. And you go up through the Waikato, with a with a few, where we've got groundwater tanks as well. They're they're in very good shape coming up into the next into the next irrigation season, and they would probably not. They would like to send it all here and not have any more up there. Winter it means maintenance, yep. and it can be very expensive if you leave it too late. Yeah, that's right. I mean, again, we're you know we're we're. We're midway through the first month of, of the winter. Uh, there's there's always a I'll get it done job, uh, and uh, if things haven't been booked in in particular, then you know there's a irrigation companies have a limited number of staff that can actually get out there and do your maintenance. So if you haven't booked them in for your maintenance, especially on uh, centre pivots and linear moves, uh, where anything major has to come from overseas. Uh, you know, if you've got a, you know a pipe or two that has to be replaced, they may or may not have that pipe in stock. Most of them will have, the, you know, the, the smaller ones in stock. But anything that's large, uh, it's going to have to come in in a container. Uh, you know, you're looking down the barrel. It's sort of six weeks before some of those parts can actually get here to New Zealand, and they would have to be backloaded or loaded in with a with an order that's coming to New Zealand. You're not going to put a 140 foot pipe in a container and bring it over. I mean, it's got to come with something else. So you've got to uh, wait for something else yeah, to be it's ready. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, and and so, you know, the effort should have been made by now to make to get that maintenance work done. Uh, these, you know, none of the equipment we use is bulletproof and has uh, and has lifelong warranty. Uh, so, you know, and, and and it's you know you wouldn't look after your tractor like some of some people look after their irrigation systems, and. And they just need to make sure they get that maintenance organised. If they're New Zealand, if, they're, if there's components that are made in New Zealand, you're probably okay. Uh, that can be dealt with. But um, it's it's actually the time it takes for each uh, irrigator to be serviced. And uh, there's a limit, as I say, there's a limited number of service people in each of the irrigation companies. And, and they're probably well booked up by now, uh, leading up to the next irrigation season. And, you know, it's two and a half months away, it could potentially. Apathy can be very expensive. It can it can cost you a lot of money by just sitting there saying, oh yeah, yeah, I'll get round to it, I'll do it, and then you know along comes August and you go, oh actually I haven't done that job, uh, and then you don't start irrigating until December. That's right. <laughs> that's true. Sitting around and thinking about things like land consent, land use consent, and water consent, still a huge issue. It is. Um, I mean, Environment Canterbury has um, particularly land use consents. Uh, if you go into the um, particularly the fully allocated groundwater zones in Canterbury, uh, most of those uh, those zones now require a land use consent to continue farming. They are advertising heavily on the radios, uh, on a number of radio channels, that um, while these things should have been done by the 1st of January, that was never going to be a reality. But this is the year. They've got to be done this year. And... So they have written to everybody they potentially believe needs a land use consent. And my understanding is that they will be following all of those people up with a phone call to make sure that they, they, have, they, are, they are in the process of getting that land use consent done. The land use consent is relatively straightforward, Rob. It's, it's, it's not a big deal, but it's the stuff you need to get done to lead up to there. You've got to have an overseer model. You have to have created your baseline nutrients. You have to have a farm environmental plan and if you haven't got those things done, then then you can't proceed and get your land use consent. So there's a few precursors that you need to make sure you're on top of before you do that. But very forewarned. Because if you don't, 
you can't carry on farming. You can't carry on farming, and you can't sell the farm because nobody else can take it over. That's right. Somebody that doesn't that some that other person has then got to try and get a land use consent, and in what might then be a prohibited activity because you haven't got it done by the due date. Seriously, we're locking gates and throwing away the key. Uh, Very yeah, expensive that, lawns. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, and for something that's not a, 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 a really big deal to get. People out there to help you? Absolutely. There's consultants like ourselves out there that are doing these things on a day-to-day -day basis, and believe me, they are not a big deal. Tony, thank you very much indeed. Next up, it's Ross going to be talking about Harcourts and their involvement with the Royal Agricultural Society and their Ambassador Awards. <music> You must be very proud. The most trusted real estate company for how many years in a row now? Five years in a row now. Rob, yeah. It's, well, it's the Reader's Digest uh, Awards. And um, yeah, we've been five years in a row. We've been awarded the most trusted brand, which is great for us. Really great. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, you're more than real estate. Let me tell me a wee bit about this rural ambassador that you're involved with. Right. With the RAS. Yep, so that's the Royal Agricultural Society. Uh, Rob, and that's uh, the Royal Agricultural Society is the, the umbrella organisation for all the AMP shows in New Zealand and all the breed societies as well. So um, they have a Royal Ambassador Award and they've been wanting to sort of upmarket it a wee bit more, give it more profile. So Harcourts has come on board as the principal sponsor for that. And this year there was two, uh, two branches picked as guinea pigs to do a regional uh, rundown uh, contest and to see how it went, you know, with the public involved and uh, the Rolston branch of Harcourt's Four Seasons was lucky enough to be selected down here. That's Rob. you. It's us, yeah. <laughs> so what is the, the Rural Ambassador and what do they have to do? Rightio, so it's it's not a uh, Young Farm of the Year competition where they don't have to milk a cow or, or, or um, you know, a dig fence post. It's more about projecting themselves as good ambassadors for the agricultural industry in New Zealand when they go overseas. So there's uh, six regions in New Zealand um, they each put four contestants, and we have this, you know, this um, regional regional contest. The uh, winner of that goes down to this year. It's in Invercargo, uh, sorry, in uh, Wanaka, where they're having their um, annual meeting, and uh, they have a gala night there, uh, where they where these uh, six uh, regional finalists get up and speak. Um, but early in the day, they will have met the judges, and the judges will have interviewed them, having looked at the judges. Will have looked at their CVs. They get interviewed. They get asked questions, and out of that panel for the afternoon that evening those they get uh, the questions asked from that um, afternoon's um, judging yeah so what do you know what they're looking for are they looking for people who are fluent and public speaking yeah well you know they're looking for people that have got they've already done a lot in agriculture that are you know potential future leaders in agriculture but people that can equip themselves well in public speaking and you know personify what we want to what do we want to portray to the rest of the world is what, where agriculture is going in New Zealand, yeah. Isn't it fabulous that Royal Agriculture Society are actually developing it? Yes. And, and what you're going with them, which yeah. is fabulous. Yeah, yeah, and the, um, you know, the, the winner gets a, a, an all expenses paid trip to Australia to represent uh, New Zealand in the Australasian final. They get uh, $2,000 cash, and I think it's about $1,500 worth of icebreaker gear as well. So, you know, it's a pretty, pretty hefty prize. And it's... As you said, two guinea pigs at the moment, yep. Ross, but then it's just going to yeah, expand out. out next year. Yeah, so we 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 had our, our contest at the Horsell um, Four Seasons Harcourt's office, and we had uh, three judges. We had John Sunk now, who's well known as a f dairy farmer from Leeston. He's a the an elected ECAN representative, which is great, and uh, he's also a chairman of um, Sale and St John's, which is fundraising to build that new building out at uh, Rolston. Yep. And he's also a qualified paramedic. We had Kevin Mackay from our Harcourts Four Seasons. He's the general manager. Um, you know, he's been in real estate a long time. He's one of the longest standing franchisees in New Zealand for Harcourts. And then we had from Melissa Jepson from the Royal Agricultural Society. And Melissa's one of those dynamo ladies as well. It's involved in everything from being a farmer to being chairperson of the Central Districts RAS to um, rugby administrator, netball coach. So um, you know, pretty involved people that we had there. And the format was that um, we had the public along, we introduced the, the contestants, um, then they were taken out to a lock-up room, brought them one at a, one, one at a time and asked the same questions. Uh, and, um, and then the judges adjudicated. We had a few nibbles and a couple of drinks and the judges come back and announced the winner. So next year, if it's, 
as you said, Harcourts and RAS are going to make it big. Make it, yeah. How do people keep an eye out to find out if they can, when they can enter? Well, um, that, that, that's all done through the Royal, the Royal Agriculture Society do that themselves, and that all goes out through their AMP societies. Yep. And that's how they get to know about it. Yeah. The winners, the uh, contestants that we had here were pretty outstanding, and the winner from this year was um, Johanna Smith, who's a, a farmer's daughter from Colwerton. Um, you know, the, the, when you read these CVs, Rob, it really makes you want, makes you wonder what the hell you and I have done the most of our lives. <laughs> these people have stacked so much in; it's unbelievable. You know, um, uh, Johanna's got a, a, a B.Ag side with first class honours from Winking University. Um, she's currently working for Ravensdown as a trainee out there, and uh, you know, if she's the winner, she'll be represent us extremely well. Isn't it refreshing to see? young people coming up through and yeah. bringing that experience, enthusiasm and knowledge. Yeah, it is, it is Rob, yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, they've actually got, they, they, um, they've got so much more going forward, like um, Johanna was involved in urine, um, you know, checking <coughs> um, the urine, <coughs> excuse me, distribution panel uh, of, um, you know, uh, cow, Yep, you know, yep, yep, farmers, yep. You know, so and, uh, all that, that she, yeah, leaching she, and all yeah. that, so she very antisocial stuff to talk about. Yeah, yeah she's done her thesis on that. And, uh, you know, that's got some huge implications going forward, and they're going to find a way through it. There's no two ways about that. Yeah. Can I applaud Harcourts for joining up with RAS, or Royal Agricultural Society? Because, with all due respect, the <coughs> Royal Agricultural Society needed somebody to come in yes. and give them yep. a bit of momentum. Yep, no, it is. Yeah, well, you know, we've got a new uh, our, um, head CEO guy for the rural side of Harcourts. There's a guy called Tom Rutherford, and Tom's an ex-real um, estate agent. And with, from a farming background, he's the right man for the right job. He's doing a great job pushing the rural side, the rural side of Harcourts along. Yeah. Very briefly, tell me about the foundation, the Harcourts Foundation. Well, that's that's an initiative that's been going for about you know, five years now. Uh, and um, for every sale, well, in our office, I'm, I'm sure most of the other offices are the same. Every sale that's done, the agent puts in ten dollars, and the company puts in ten dollars, and it goes to the, uh, the the Harcourts Foundation. Currently, I think we're about we're just over four million, four million something other we've raised already. Uh, for it, and people can go online, see the criteria, and, and apply to get money for it. You know, for their charities, whatever they want to work at. And um, like out in the area there, um, uh, what do we get on out there now? A mental block here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. You've done a, You've done a, So basically, you've got this huge amount of money, yep. and if you got, if you meet the criteria, yep, yep. you can apply to Harcourts yep. and, and, and get it. And that's right. Yep. Yep. Well, all power to your elbow, Ross. And, yeah. And so, actually, I tell you what, I've undercut ourselves here. Rob, we've raised 4733000 as of last night. As of last as night. As of last night. And, yeah, out in the Rolleston there, we um, we gave five, well, they, they, St. John's applied to us for their new building up there, and they uh, we granted them $5,000 for that. Um, I know we gave about $3,500 a few years ago to the Whedon's Primary School. And, um, yeah, so if you just go online, anyone that's interested, go online, have a look, see what the criteria is, and... You put your application in. We've got we've got money waiting to be distributed. Wonderful. Yeah. Congratulations to you guys. Yeah. So there you are, Harcourts is more than just a very well trusted brand. Back in a moment or two talking horticulture with Jim Grayson. Jim herbicides, I guess it's that time of year. Well it certainly is. Now that we've got into the winter and we're actually starting to get some good cold frosts. Uh, that's when the, the, the plants are actually, or the weeds are actually drawing in their energy to try and stay alive. So this is when you put the herbicides on. You just quietly kick them while they're down. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is that, um, and already the weeds are starting to deteriorate a little bit. So growers are sort of re reluctant to say, well, should I be putting the herbicides on? Are they going to take it in? They certainly are, because they are really looking to pull down the, that, that moisture. Uh, and, and keep look after the carbohydrates as far as the weeds go, as as do the uh, the trees and the vines and what have you. And but of course it sucks in the herbicide, and the next thing they've got a headache and they fall over and die. So now is the time. There's good ground moisture in terms of um, residual herbicides. We don't use a lot of residual herbicides across any of the horticultural crops now, as we did in the old days. But there are still some specific ones that we need to use to get rid of some of the harder to kill weeds. And they need to be applied no later than probably about, if I put a date around it, it's probably not quite right, but the end of July, because uh, the, you're starting to get uh, root movement, uh, hair root movement underground, and they can take up some of these residual herbicides. So the idea is to get those on while it's still quite nice and dormant and cold, 
and they'll do a really good job and they'll go right through to the early part of the summer, which what, that's what we want them to do. Growers sometimes make a comment, they'll say, um, well, you know, some of those weeds have got away in me in November. Well, so they should, because it tells you, one, that the residual herbicide has actually run out, and we don't want that in the soil profile. And secondly, uh, you've got other easier knockdown herbicides that'll deal with that, that weed spectrum at that time, if need be. I guess prunings in full swing? Prunings in, in really in full swing, especially with the grape guys that got stuck in, the apple guys would be well, well into theirs now. What, what, the, what we do do um, with various crops, Rob, is to, judging what the winter's going to be like and seeing that probably there's going to be some uh, spring frost this year, uh, more so than last year, uh, growers will determine which varieties of crop, whatever they may be, to prune. Because if you prune a crop, it immediately goes into looking for the spring and uh, it'll bud break its bud, uh, bud a little bit earlier than normal or on the, on the right time. So if you want to delay bud break and spread your crop a little bit, you actually prune, your pruning regime has got quite an influence to that. And in fact, what you do at pruning has a lot to do with what you set up and how you set up your crop for your next 12 months. So it's a very important time. It's not a time to have a whole lot of people out there that don't know what they're doing. And now that we've got a, a, a quite a history now of, um, of um, bringing in um, workers from overseas, Vanuatu and, and the likes, uh, they, these people are good skilled people now. They've had two or three years at it. They're responsible, they're hard working, and they, they, the growers make sure they, they do the cuts in the right places. So it's, it's a pretty good system really, very, very, very well uh, planned. And the only thing that we've got to watch, if you're going to have some damp, misty sort of days, you've got to make sure you have your fungicide dipping uh, and, and put on any big wounds to make sure that they seal off before the, uh, they get dry. Smaller wound, it'll dry up straight away, but uh, a bigger wound, it can take in some diseases which we don't want. As looking back, how's the harvest? Well, it, look, it, it was pretty good. Everywhere, the, the, the volume was down, uh, and that starts right back at stone fruit and going right through to pip fruit. But the pack outs, the quality of the fruit has been fantastic. Um, this year, the, the juice guys have been complaining they have not had enough uh, uh, what we call um, overrun export fruit. Sort of to, to, yeah, to produce. Well, I didn't want to call them that. <laughs> I but, just but, did, sorry. But overrun export for, for the production of juice. And they've had very, very little of it. I mean, the apple industry in Hawke's Bay and down in, in Nelson are producing 95, 96% pack out, which is fantastic for the growers and fantastic for our markets. Beautiful, uh, correct size fruit, nice colour. Uh, so all good in that respect. Stone fruit was exactly the same. Down a bit on quality, uh, quantity, but certainly not on quality, especially the cherry cherry market was, was really good. And then you get into your various berry fruit crops. Uh, all have been down a bit. The raspberries and strawberries around Christmas time were, were challenged because the season was running a little bit late and we didn't hit the high volumes for Christmas, New Year, where, where people eat a lot of you know, strawberries on their pavlova and that sort of thing. But um, it, it elongated the season a bit and the, and the prices held up quite nicely because of the lack of fruit. But the, what was there was really good. And now we've gone into the grape industry and, and uh, the viticulture it, it varied by region really. Uh, Central Otago had a pretty good uh, harvest, low crop, but uh, because it was cool at harvest time, but it wasn't wet. So they were able to get the crop off. Um, in time and without too much damage. Uh, but when you move up into Canterbury and we had a bit of frost earlier on and we had uh, a bit of dampness during the latter part of the season, that, that affected the, the uh, volume, but not necessarily the quality. And then when we got into Marlborough and the, big, the big, bigger regions, they certainly had some problems uh, with weather and we had uh, quite a bit of botrytis about and some of the, some of the blocks were left. Uh, but what was harvested was good fruit but a little bit back on what they anticipated initially. Um, so I think 20, you know, 2017 vintage will be, a, will be a good vintage, but it won't be the volume that we uh, predicted initially. And then we then we get into uh, the kiwi fruits going, still going just about finished now, but still going very, very well. Avocados, tamarillos all gone well in the north. Avocados have been an absolute dream this year. They've, They've tripled in value. Um, the Australian market has been a bit tricky, and uh, so, sorry, the, the growing of the Australian fruit has been a bit tricky. So it's improved our markets here, and we're, we're producing a world-class avocado, and that, that industry is going along extremely well, which is really great to see. And, and it's, it's found a niche in the world now, especially in the Asian uh, and uh, Australasian markets, as being a good quality fruit, com coming in at the right time 
and uh, and now with our plant breeding that's gone on, and that they've, they've really started to get some value back into the business, which is which is marvellous to see. And I've just come back <coughs> from Sydney, where it's every menu's plastered with avocado <laughs> smashed or something. You know, <coughs> it's very fashionable. It, it is fashionable because it's healthy. You know, it's a it's a good way to get essential fats and uh, acid fatty acids, and and we we need those as consumers. And it's got a nice unique flavour. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but most mostly it is, and you can absorb it into meals, and as you say, avocado mash or whatever it may be, and uh, it adds it adds colour and it also adds vibrance to to the taste uh, uh, area. So it's it's really good, good good product to have. Jim, thanks very much indeed. In just a moment or two, we're going to be playing the third part of our mental health trilogy. This is aimed at the youth, but it's also vital that the older generation take a look as well. That's in a moment or two. Suicide and depression. There's no limit to age or gender. It can strike anybody of any age. And when it does, those that are left will take it personally. Yeah, it is personal. Um, in my family, even though my sister uh, had mental health issues for quite a long period of her life, uh, a year ago she decided that it was just too much and by herself just decided to end it and uh, her body wasn't actually discovered for three days. And that's really tough. You know, we knew she had issues, we'd supported her through a whole lot of things and in the end, coming out the other side, she's, you know, supposedly a lot better and then it happens. So yeah, it is personal. And it makes me think that um, if that could happen to us and, and we, we're well experienced with uh, understanding mental illness and understanding uh, how difficult it is, if we didn't see it coming, how does the, the average person in New Zealand that doesn't have normal contact with, with that sort of thing, how do you identify these things? One of our club members, uh, we've got 15 clubs in the region, uh, at Cambridge Club we had a member um, who committed suicide uh, mid last year. Uh, so Kevin yeah, took his own life and that had pretty uh, astronomical effect onwards throughout the members and then of course for us here in the region. Um, a, a really friendly guy, super outgoing, um, so obviously real shocked to get that phone call. Kevin was someone who was a part of part of the club and someone who um, he was always there, always helping out, always um, always willing to give his time and um, had, had a big smile on his face. So um, while I haven't been around the club a lot recently, uh, certainly certainly know, know Kevin and know how, how loved he was by everybody and um, yeah, how, how I guess any, any club, any community, rugby, netball, um, young farmers, you do, you do look out for each other and so you do feel it when you lose someone. A young guy, 28, uh, decided that it was too much for him and had, you know, had young girls, um, really tragic. And we had club members that saw him the day before and there was no sign. And so I thought, right, we've got to do something about this. You know, we've got to take, take ownership of the fact that uh, young people in particular have very little opportunity to understand, identify and then do something about and feel comfortable and confident to confront suicide. You know, even the word suicide, uh, people don't want to say. So yeah, it's personal from a, from a family point of view and then from our organisation. We've, we've lost uh, three people in the last couple of years, three too many. Um, and, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's a tragedy that I think can be averted. For Sam Robinson, it's very personal. Extremely personal, it doesn't get much closer to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your story? Oh, if I had access to my guns I wouldn't be standing here talking to you. Um, I've been battling depression since I was 17, 10 years. Did admit it for about five years and it's been with me ever since. What did you do Sam? If I finally, once I started speaking about it, gone to a lot of doctors, I want antidepressants, different psychologists, cognitive behaviour therapy, trying everything to try and get rid of it. And it hangs in there? Definitely, you think you're getting past it and it comes back and grabs you and pulls you down even more. So how do we fix it when people won't talk, but they will hide it? Sometimes we, we can just sense that something's not right and sometimes we don't know what to say or should we say anything or should it be someone else's job, but I think it is all of our jobs just to say, hey, you know, not how are you, but how are you really doing? And to, 
and to just give people an opportunity space. Some people don't like that really uh, direct question, so um, you know, going for a walk or hopping in the truck and going for a drive so that you're not often face to face but you can talk side by side and sometimes that works really well too and you're right, asking, asking the question and and not being afraid, it's, it's, it's everybody's job to look out for each other, it's what we're here for. New Zealand Young Farmers has really taken the lead on this, we feel that we cannot hide when something happens and so we had a couple of incidents last year and one was a tragic suicide of a father with young children and the point from that was that we didn't shy away from it, we didn't try and cover it up, we brought it out in the open and said look, we understand there are issues out in our community. There's a lot of pressure on young people. There always has been, but there's even more today, I think, with, particularly with university and the way things are going. And I think we are saying, let's be transparent. Let's go to our club meetings and say, hey, we're not going to feel all right all of the time, and it's okay to talk about it. So this Good Yarn Workshop initiative and the work we're putting in is all about protecting our young people, nurturing them and giving them an environment where they can talk and speak freely. And in that room today, I've seen that already with young farmer members just talking openly about their experiences. And, and at the end of the day, the reality is over 50% of those people in that room will just, you know, they'll suffer depression at some stage in their life and it may not be diagnosed. That's the thing we just need to make it more open and more acceptable to talk about it at the minute someone that's struggling doesn't want to talk and people sort of ignore the fact and they need to take it on themselves to notice the signs of people that are struggling that are closing themselves off, lashing out, acting differently and ask them if they're all right and keep asking them if they're right rather than just thinking it's not their problem and yeah hopefully we can change the societal view that depression's okay to talk about. And then there's the stigma if only we could come up with a word that didn't say committed suicide because that reeks of it being a crime, but it's not. But the stigma is very real. Uh, well, we find that there's a bit of a stigma uh, attached to it, especially in the farming community. Uh, there's a bit of a get on with it approach or man up or those kind of uh, words attached uh, with it. Um, so uh, becoming a facilitator of this program, uh, one of the things I wanted to get across to people um, was that um, uh, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing to be um, suffering from mental health and uh, those stigmas um, are pretty old school. Um, so these days uh, we just need to help people through it um, and show them support rather than uh, attaching that stigma to it. My own father committed suicide when I was five years old and I lived in a rural community and it, there was a huge stigma around it, so much so that I was kind of labelled as the child that, you know, whose father committed suicide 15 years later. Uh, and I can say honestly to this day, you know, um, that every day I think of him and it affects the way I am and who I am today. So the, the after effects of suicide is just tremendous. It doesn't go away. I wonder every day what he would think of me now and, and who I am and who I've become. And I wonder what he would have been like because he died younger than I am now. And that's, that, that's quite a, an eerie thought, really. And it's so judgmental. And that's you know, something that, and I guess I was as judgmental as the next person until you experience it yourself. You know what, these people don't decide to do it just to, uh, to, to annoy other people or, you know, they're not thinking about consequences. They're not thinking about the impact is to people around them. Like this guy I was talking about, a young farmer's member, had two uh, preschool girls. Now he wasn't thinking, you know what, I'm going to screw their lives up, uh, potentially, by doing this. So, it, yeah. To me, the commit word is uh, a blame word, and I we've got to move away from that. It's bloody terrible, especially when I started as a young bloke, testosterone fuel. The last thing I want to do is be labelled as weak, or not right in the head and all sorts. And that sort of crashes you and holds you back from talking about it. It makes it worse. You just chew in your own head and you never get away from it. There is a huge stigma around depression uh, and we think we are getting on top of it but really we're not. When you talk to the rural community it is inherently inside that community, that stigma. I did not tell anyone I had depression until recently, about two years ago I started speaking out about it and saying look 
I don't care if you know if I had depression, it doesn't change me as a person. And I think people like John Kerwin have made great inroads in that area and Doug Avery by speaking out, but we need more people to come forward. We need more people to tell their stories. And some of our young farmer members have been so brave in telling us their stories and it's helped. Every time someone tells a story, there's, you know, a hundred people will contact us and say, look, I've had the same thing. I'm so grateful they spoke out. So be brave, be brave, share your story because that's the only way we're going to improve the situation. Young people have very different pressures to the rest of us. Well they're everywhere, they come from every angle because the world's so massive, you expect it to know what you're going to do. Um, parents, grandparents, everyone thinks you should know what you want to do from when you're young and if you don't fit that mould, well, you're quite trapped, it sort of can get into your head and bury you with the pressure. And it's bloody hard for a young person to deal with that pressure and then it goes back to talking. Can they talk to someone about it or do they bottle it up and it can just trap them even more. Everyone has pressures in their life. I don't think it matters how old you are. Um, I, I do think we're probably much more socially connected, um, but I, I think it's, it is different. Like It's a different type of connectivity um, and the fact that it isn't that human relation. You, you, you can read a Facebook post and it seems really happy, uh, but we can often, um, you know, the Instagram effect where you just see the, the happy snippets of everyone's life, you, so you can judge that against actually what's the real life in your life, which it's not always so great. Uh, but that's life, it's the, the whole package and it's learning how to deal with that and I think that's probably something that we have that's a little bit different in terms of that social media and how that affects us. I since found out on both sides of my family there is a history of depression and it was kept under the, you know, kept under the carpet as you say. Uh, and I myself, I have three siblings and uh, I suffered from depression uh, at an early age, in my early 20s, at a time when I was on top of the world, you know, I, I, I think I just won a major journalism award, uh, everything was going well in my life and my friends would not have known how I was feeling and I just, uh, I, you know, I really hit the wall and uh, actually I remember one day driving to work at Timaru and thinking, oh, it'd be so peaceful to, to just to drive into the river and it would be all over. And um, once I realised how serious that was, I did seek help. And uh, it's not something that ever goes away, you have to manage it. I am, I'm now off medication, but uh, I certainly went through some pretty low points and uh, it wasn't something I felt I could openly share with people. And so now when I see young people really struggling, and a lot of them are struggling through university, uh, and a lot of it comes from bullying at school and, 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 and times like that or low points in their life, it really concerns me because I know I've been there, I understand that it. it happened to me at the same age and I know how hard it can be to open up and talk to people and say, hey, I'm not really feeling all right. And uh, that's a really difficult people, thing for people to, to, to understand, that it's not easy for people to go up to someone and say, look, I, you know, I'm not really feeling that great. Uh, because in New Zealand we have a culture of we just get on with it, you know, that's, that's the good old fashioned culture. But we have to change that mindset if we are to progress and get these statistics down. Do we need to get young people to learn to talk again because, quite frankly, many of us would suggest that they now rely on text messages and Twitter and that sort of communication rather than one-on-one? -on -one? We, we talk a lot through technology uh, today uh, and sometimes the feelings thing is, is hard to talk about. Uh, yeah, I, th I think we do talk, we just need to be uh, not worried about a potentially confronting or a conflicting situation and that if it is going to be difficult then we still need to not shy away from it and talk about it. Social media is disgusting, it's sort of ruined everything in my opinion because people don't sit down and go to the pub or have a coffee and have a chat about feelings. Through social media you can't show emotion, no one's going to pick up if you're not feeling well, you can just put an act on and everything's fine and it's like even my friends and I, we don't sit down and talk that much, it's usually through Facebook or Messenger or text. It just needs to go back to the old ways, if it wasn't there, maybe we wouldn't have this such a predicament we do now with depression and mental health being so massive. The, the downside of social media and the reliance on not needing to talk to people is that people are moving further and further away from being able to ask for help in the traditional sense. And that's why I think the great thing about something like New Zealand Young Farm is that groups people together physically is by default you have to talk um, and if you see each other you know, often enough to actually notice that someone um, and, and we know that there are, there's plenty of times where people don't show any symptoms or, or change of personality and they just don't turn up the next day 
but for some people where there are actually visible signs, if you think you know, back um, in hindsight, is be able to go, you know what, Rob, you're not yourself today. Where's Rob that I know? And, but we don't say that. So we need to empower young people to go, you know, it's all right to talk like that. I, I employ a lot of young people in the office and they, you know, they don't treat me like I treated my boss when I was young, that whole you know, deference to authority. Young people, have, one of the things they have got is the skill of just saying it how it is. So I get challenged all the time thinking, oh, could I just get talked to like that? Because it's un unusual for me, for young people actually confronting and being, you know what, whatever it is, blah, 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 they're quite happy to do it. So they're blatantly honest. They are blatantly honest, and it's a good thing. So if we can convert that ability to going a step further and going, what's on your mind? Uh, or, you know, you don't seem right, uh, what's going on? Then we're more likely to get a bit more open communication and people actually saying, no, I don't feel right. And then you can go, okay, what are we going to do about it? I mean, I think that's part of the beauty of Young Farmers is that we're actually dragging people um, out of their comfort zone and to, into real life conversations as opposed to hiding behind uh, a screen. Uh, so I think that that's something that we're start, we've lost a little bit over the last couple of years, but I think it's something that we've definitely realised that we need to uh, kind of come back to is that just one-on-one -on -one conversation. Is Facebook a problem that's stopping people talking or is it still a channel that when somebody alerts that there's a problem on Facebook that we stop, listen and act. Uh, I believe so. I, you know, there's going to be plenty of cases where people cry wolf um, and that's unfortunate but I think where there is uh, cry, you know, cries of help on Facebook they should be followed up because it could be one of the ones that actually is for real. I'd rather waste time with people that are, oh no I didn't mean it, to yeah, I did mean it, and you've caught me. Thank you very much. That's a much more powerful story to go and tell your friends about. One of the major barriers for young people is feeling alone and isolated within a family or within a group. They don't think that we older people will listen, and 99 times out of 100, they probably don't. So how can we older generation help well, Rob, you know yourself, you, you, you've had you know, issues with depression, you've been very brave in speaking out about it and I, I applaud you on that. I think what I'm hearing from young people is that the older generation don't necessarily understand uh, depression or have an inability to talk about it with their children. I've heard of some young people who have said their parents still can't get their heads around they've been, their children have been diagnosed with depression and I think that's just the, the, the culture they were brought up in and the fact that you, you kept your problems to yourself. Farming is a very isolated industry in New Zealand and because of that it does inherently leave people to want to bring their, you know, keep their problems to themselves and so often we hear of suicides in older farmers who have never spoken out about their, their feelings or nobody has ever had any inclination, let alone their partners or their families, that they're suffering. I'm hoping this new generation is going to be different and by them opening up and being transparent, parents and an older generation can see, hey, it's okay, it's okay to admit not everything's fine all the time because nobody's ever happy all the time, are they? There's a feeling that young people aren't, uh, haven't experienced hardship enough to be feeling like this. That's a, an older person's view, you know. Typically an older person like myself will go, you know, you guys haven't lived yet. What do you know about pressure? What do you know about stress? Work, work in my life for a day. And that's, a, again, it's a prejudice. So because there's, and, and prejudice, uh, we think uh, uh, f fly under the radar. They're pretty obvious to the person that you're talking to. So if they feel that older people who are role models, who are peoples of authority, actually aren't approachable because they don't understand, what do they do? They haven't necessarily got opportunities or skills to actually reach out like you and I might have if we're lucky. We actually might be able to be self-aware enough to go, you know what, I'm not right, I may need to ask. A young person certainly doesn't have that ability. And if, and if older people are sort of giving off the impression that, I'll oh, just harden up, uh, or you haven't lived long enough yet to, to really feel pressure, then uh, there's no solution for them. Oh, they don't quite understand, especially with these social media things. What? Say if it's from bullying or any other pressure, you can't escape it through social media and parents don't quite understand it's not just going to school or work and it finishes when you walk out the door, but you're constantly in that world 
They're feeling the pressure, feeling everything against you. And I think they need to realise that there's that change, that it's, you're not just safe in your own home anymore. But feelings are real for young people. Like they do feel the pressure a lot more than they did back in the day because there are so many options. And it's just taking over. For the older people, I just want to suggest that you may not think that you don't have a relationship with your children that would stop them talking to you. But do you really think that they would? I'd like to congratulate young farmers for their good yarn program. That's a step in the right direction. Sadly, it's only a small one at this stage, but I give my full support and I do hope that their Good Young program will reach every young person in New Zealand. It is a serious problem, we all know that, but it's a case of education, it's a case of opening the doors, and it's a case of getting rid of the stigma because it's no different to a broken leg. That gets healed, mental health gets ignored far too often.